This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. I'm joined this week by my co-host, Dan Lynch, and we'll be talking about the new Declaration for Digital Autonomy written by Molly DeBlanc and Karen Sandler, and there will be guests on our show coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from Last Pass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 597. Recorded Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020. Declaration of Digital Autonomy. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash floss. And by Worldwide Technology. WWT's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab with more than a half billion dollars of equipment, including solutions from key partners like Intel Corporation. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it offers, go to WWT.com slash twit. Hi, everybody. I'm Doc Searles. Welcome to Floss Weekly. Uh, my co-host this week is Dan Lynch. Howdy, Dan. Let's put Dan up on screen for those of us who are watching. There he is. Hi, uh, good to be back. So where where on the planet are you, Dan, so we can triangulate this yeah. thing? <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm across the uh, across the Atlantic, or maybe across the Pacific, and if you went a lot further around that yeah. way as well. Uh, I'm in the UK. I'm in uh, Liverpool in the UK, and my... Uh, home studio here with my cactuses behind me and uh, <laughs> yeah, enjoying the, um, the the end of the sudden end of summer here in the UK and the uh, advent of autumn. Yeah, here uh, I'm in I'm in Los Angeles where our, uh, it's fire season. It's still fire here, and uh, those cactuses belong here, by the way. And uh, so and so I'm not only one pond, but also a whole continent away from away from you. So. Um, uh, the Declaration of Digital Autonomy is our topic this week. Are, are, you're up on that too, I, I hope, right? Yeah, I read it. Uh, I read it actually today, and I watched um, Molly and Karen's talk as well about the uh, the creation of it. And uh, it's it's a really interesting uh, interesting thing that they're doing, and I think it's going to be a really good discussion as well. I agree. We're actually off to a bit of a late start today, so um, we'll we'll press ahead, and I'll. I uh, tell you that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Express VPN. Uh, there are tons of VPN providers out there. You've probably heard of a few. Some of you may have even used a VPN before. I recommend brands to my listeners that I trust, and I can always say that Express VPN is the best one on the market because I'm using it right now, and uh, it's been very handy for me. Uh, a little more about that in a moment, but. The main thing is that ExpressVPN doesn't log your data. Many of the cheaper free VPNs make money by selling your data to ad companies. ExpressVPN uh, developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your information. Another thing is speed. Many other VPNs slow your connection down or make your device sluggish. Um, and I can tell you, I've uh, I've AB'd ExpressVPN uh, against other VPNs that I've used, and and I've not found anyone that's faster. Um, even when I log into servers uh, on the other side of the world, like the UK, which I log into more than any other place, um, uh, I can say that there's it, it's almost like it's a it's a, a direct connection. The the last thing that really sets ExpressVPN apart from other VPNs is how easy it is to use. Unlike others. You don't have to input or program anything. You just fire up the app, and it's just got one button. I've always got that button in the corner of my screen ready to go. It's so easy, easy even your, your grandparents can use it. If they can use a screen and a pointer, they can they can use ExpressVPN. Uh, and the, lots of publications, Wired, The Verge, CNET, and many other tech experts rate ExpressVPN number one uh, in the world, and everybody here 
uh, at Twit also uses it and has nothing but good things to say about it, quite aside from the fact that we really appreciate them sponsoring our shows. So protect yourself with a VPN that we use and trust. Um, use the link expressvpn.com slash floss today. That's express vpn.com slash floss and get an extra three months free on a one year package. That's expressvpn.com slash floss and visit that link to learn more. Okay. So on with the show, our, uh, our, our guests this week are, uh, are two, uh, Karen Sandler and, uh, Molly DeBlanc. They together wrote the declaration of digital autonomy, uh, which, when I saw it, totally turned me on. Um, I think it's a, just the title alone uh, excited me. I, Karen's the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, uh, she's been an executive director of the Gnome Foundation, general counsel for the Software Freedom Law Center. She out, co- co-organizes Outreachy. Uh, she's an adjunct faculty member of Columbia Law School, visiting scholar at UC Santa Cruz. Um, she's the uh, recipient of the Free Software Foundation's Award for Achievement in Free Software and an O'Reilly Open Source Award. Uh, Molly, uh, besides co-writing, uh, that has just has, I know her from uh, as a colleague at the Berkman Klein Found, uh, Center at Harvard Law School. Um, we were together there and played Bananagrams together a few years ago. Um, she's on on the Open Source Initiative Board of Directors, President of the Board, Debian Developer, Delegate on the Community Team. Uh, Gnome Code of Conduct Committee. She's a graduate student at NYU in the global public hell in global public health, and she once biked from Boston to Montreal for a Debian conference. So, I, I don't want to say there's too much I can say about them, but we we started late. So I'd I'd like to go right into um, what got you guys going on this, and uh, you know w- what absence in the world led you to to to, to write this. So. I started thinking about this in terms of... Oh, okay. okay. Thanks, Molly. I was (laughs) starting. (laughs) Fine. Anyway. Um, You don't have the hand signal. Go go um, ahead. So so I started thinking about this because of the issues that are um, literally close to my heart. I have a heart condition. I have a very big heart and I have a pacemaker defibrillator um, that is implanted in my body. And the whole process of like needing that defibrillator, it's a whole topic on itself and I won't talk about it now, but uh, made me realize that we are not in control of the technology that is in our own body. And as the like I lived with my defibrillator, I had a whole, you know, first I started thinking it was about transparency and I needed to be able to see the source code of my own body. And then as I lived with my defibrillator and I had things happen, like I was inappropriately shocked by my defibrillator when I was pregnant because my heart was palpitating, which is normal for pregnant women. Um, and so I realized that our devices may not may be made for us. And I realized that I it wasn't just about transparency. It was also about the ability to modify and control that software. And then when I needed a new defibrillator, I realized that the only defibrillators that were available on the market all broadcast by default all the time with really very minimal security. And that really alarmed me. And I was able to get the one defibrillator available on the market where you can disable the radio telemetry and software. And I started thinking about this originally as the right not to broadcast because the idea is that like I have this defibrillator and it's always on, always sending information and I don't have the ability to do anything about it. So I um, I started thinking about that. And as I went down that path, it became clear that all of these issues were actually very closely related and that, um, and that for me, it became about the idea of digital autonomy. It's your. Uh, that's um, interesting. It's, it's your body and your life, right? I mean, that that, that couldn't be more or close to home. So, Dan, I think I heard you start to say something. So, do you want to? Yeah, it's. Yeah, sure. So, so yeah. The, the term digital autonomy. I think we should we should uh, ask Molly this one. What what does the term digital autonomy mean to you guys? I mean, what? How would you describe that to somebody? I can talk about what it means to me, and that's a little bit different than what it would mean to Karen. Um, uh, I will say that Karen, as far as I'm aware, coined the term digital autonomy, uh, and I quickly latched onto that. Um, 
I come or came to this discussion with this academic background in philosophy and this like very political childhood. Um, so I came with this, this like conceptual basis of autonomy as this idea of self-governance and the right to self-governance really meaning like, this is, this is my body. This is my space. This is my life and my existence. And I should be the one who makes decisions about it and be in control of that. Um, and I felt as though there was just this huge disconnect between what was happening in terms of discussions of like physical autonomy and bodily autonomy and these digital spaces and technologies. Um, so, you know, it, it, I would say that in one sense, there's like, to me, an obvious connection between them, but a very real connection to say that the rights that we think of as fundamental um, to our existences outside of computing uh, is also true within computing and within digital spaces. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's it as you say, it's it's quite a personal thing, I suppose, and it does mean different things to to different people. Um, I've got to confess, this is I was this is really silly of me, but when I first saw the title of the show and I didn't know who our guests were, I thought it was going to be something to do with cars. When it said autonomy, I was like, oh, digital autonomy of you know automated cars or something because i'm i'm a, i'm an idiot but there we go but uh, it can vary it can obviously mean many things to many people um i thought initially of of um user freedom basically is what it meant to me or the the autonomy to con you know autonomy control over yourself if you like rather than having somebody else control you be it the technology whoever makes the technology or so on um is that a, a fair kind of characterization do you think oh, sorry that was to molly again uh, i should direct this <laughs> so you know okay. yeah. Um, I, I think this is, I actually think this is a really good conversation. Like that's a really good question to direct to Karen. Um, because I think mm -hmm. she has a whole lot to say about user freedom, especially in this context. Um, I can answer, but I don't want to take this opportunity no, away from her. Far, far away, Karen. I, okay. Sure. I mean, it's funny because I was thinking Molly has so much to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you, and I have a slight lag, so I'm just going to like leave a lot of space between when I speak and when other people speak. Um, okay, so uh, so yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you, Dan, and I think that we have a lot of terms and we're all struggling to get at the same point, which is to say that we are cognizant that a lot of technology is being created by corporations that is being used by individuals many of whom have no idea what they're using or what the implications of those those choices are. And um, and from our perspective at my, my work, which is primarily at the Software Freedom Conservancy, we are um, we fight for software freedom in particular and the idea that um, that there are licenses, well for, across a part of our work is that is that if if the GPL or a copyleft license has been chosen, we have rights with respect to the software that is given to us. We should be able to request that source code and we should be able to modify the software on our devices to make them um, be better for us. And so and and what's amazing is that Linux is on the kernel is on so many devices, but they are shipped in a way that is locked down and also that prevents users from taking control. And so what's wild is that there are all these devices that theoretically should have these rights baked into them, but because violations on copyleft are so prevalent, um, we don't have access to the source code in actuality and we can't modify it. So we have no control. So even, so users don't know that they have rights with respect to their software. They don't know that their devices are spying on them. They don't know that their devices are are doing things that are in the corporate interests of the manufacturers. They're starting to get an idea. But at the same time, a lot of these devices should be shipped with the rights. And even if users know that they have these rights, they can't do anything about it. So we're left in this situation where we've ceded a lot of control to, um, to corporations and we as individuals and we as collectives don't necessarily know, like don't necessarily have any power to have any skin in the game. And Molly has a lot to say on this particular point. So I might mm. kick it to her. Can I respond to what Karen said? Um, which is that was actually not what I thought you were gonna say. Uh, um, okay. so in, in case, uh, just to kind of have everybody on the same page, when we talk about user freedom, we talk about the rights users have with respect to technology 
generally in the context of having like the right to control it, to modify it, to study it, like looking at kind of like the software freedom rights and the way the user fits into that story. Um, so in response to Dan's question, <laughs> Uh, I want to say that I think, mm -hmm. and this is what I thought Karen was going to say, user freedom is part of the story, but um, it's not the complete story. It's something that fits into discussions about digital autonomy and a more complete picture of what it means for our rights to exist in digital spaces and with respect to technology. So, so, so I have, a, uh, because most people probably listening uh, are not looking at uh, at your declaration. I, I, I want to give the outline of it because you're you're calling for the adoption of, of four principles that, um, that ethical technology works to service of the people who use it. It involves informed consent. It empowers individual and collective digital action and protects people's privacy and other rights by design, and. Um, you know, we, we've all been in, on the same barricades on this thing for a very long time, and uh, and I'm involved in overlapping work on this. And the, to me, the, the big problem in the first place kind of is that we settled on client-server, which is almost is like a euphemism for slave-master a long time ago. And the Internet should have actually freed us from that because the Internet protocol doesn't have a client-server design. The, the web doesn't itself, but in implementation it does. And we're always the clients, they're always the servers. And and I was thinking, maybe I address this to Karen because um, of your particular situation, because in, in medicine it's even worse in some ways. It's been this way for a long time. You are utterly, as, as the patient, even the term patient, you're just kind of waiting around, right? You, you have to be patient while the actual professionals mm -hmm. that know more than you do are pulling all the strings and you're, you're an effect and not a cause. And, but I think that there, where, where I want to go with this and I'll address this first to Karen, but then you can jump in after that, Molly, and, is what, when are, we're looking for effects here, right? We, we don't just want to say something. We actually are looking for effects. How do you see this going? How do you see this being adopted? So just to respond to what you said, Doc, I, I think that, we're actually in a worse situation than you described with respect to my health condition, which is to say that doctors really don't, some of them do, but many of them have no understanding of the technology. Electrophysiologists that implant these devices, that implant thousands per year, hundreds per year, they don't have any fundamental understanding of this technology. And that's true across all fields where under, like a deep understanding of the implications of the connectivity that we're putting into these devices and all of the other aspects of our technology, there it's simply uh, obscured. And so we're marching forward on this path, and there's a, a with a sometimes an inadvertent um, uh, blindness, but often a willful blindness to what's you know what's what's right. And actually, I hesitate. I apologize for using that term. It maybe wasn't the best one to choose, but uh, but I think that with respect to um, issues around user freedom and everything else, all of these, all of our fields have been totally siloed before. So I've been working, I've been the advocating for software freedom, and that's been my little area of advocacy. But when it comes to um, medical device security, I come in with my software freedom angle, and then there's uh, somebody else who is uh, the, the data privacy person, and there's somebody else who is, uh, you know, uh, all the different pieces of it. And we need to look holistically at our technology for all of these issues together, and we need to bring the general public up to speed on the edu on, and become educated about this so that we can take collective action. And so the Declaration of Digital Autonomy is is in part an educational um, uh, effort, but it's also a real um, a real call to arms for technologists. So it's it's both because we need to co coalesce around what we think we what we think we should demand from our technology, both as 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 users and as makers, and then also as as uh, as collectives and as a society. So. Uh, it, it, it's a couple of questions here, but um, let, let me address this one to Molly, which is, you know, it, it, how is, is this a, there's a how question here. You know, how, how does, how does this have effect? How do you, how do you get the, how do you get people behind it? How do you get technologists behind it? Um, uh, 
you know, how do you how do you get law behind it? it, it is, is law irrelevant in this case? And, and we're really talking about tech. So I think uh, I'm, I'm in a, a, a graduate program uh, studying bioethics at NYU right now. So every time somebody asks a question, I have a bazillion answers and I think about all the papers I've been reading. Um, so I'm going to try to not cite them all at this moment. Uh, but one of the things um, I've been thinking about a lot uh, in relation to my reading has been um, that uh, like actually political theory is, is super meaningful. So like we, we are going to have to talk about laws and like legislative interactions and policies and regulations at some point. And regulations are a huge topic right now. Um, I remember seeing some headline the other day that was like, Facebook wants to pull out of, or says they'll pull out of Europe if regulations are passed. And then at the same time, Mark Zuckerberg is saying, please regulate me. Um, uh, so from like this, this, this like practical, practical perspective, uh, I think there are a lot of parts to adoption. And one of them is doing things like this, which is just talking, um, with people, uh, and kind of getting the word out. Um, I've been doing a lot of writing, um, uh, and Karen and I are going to be doing hopefully some more, well, some more publishing, hopefully soon, um, as well as more outreach with people. Um, and there's like, there are lists of things we, we would like to do when it comes to talking with technologists and interfacing with technologists, like looking at who are groups of people who would be interested in talking with us, who would be interested in learning from us. You know, um, I think librarians, uh, uh, library workers are, uh, like, they're, they're huge allies to digital rights movements and people who drive forward amazing initiatives all the time um, and are at like the forefront of a lot of a lot of rights based issues. Um, uh, I think talking with, like something I'm personally very interested in um, is uh, people working with domestic abuse survivors um, because that's also like another category of people that are at the forefront of like helping uh, people understand the way that their world is in, like they're interacting with their world in ways to be safer and do it better. Um, I mean, if you're curious about like some really specific things, uh, I can like make pitches of kind of spitball ideas and be like, Hey, well, I thought about this and I thought about this and this other thing might be fun. Um, but in general, you know, it's, it's like build awareness at a technology level build awareness at a corporate level, help empower people to make actions. Um, and I mean, I would like to, I, I think there has to be some sort of regulatory process at some point. Um, though this isn't a thing Karen and I talked about before, so sorry if I just surprised you, Karen. No, and I, I completely agree with you. And I think that we should note that our draft is at, at the 0 0.1 stage. So uh, we're looking for feedback. This is a, a first attempt. And these issues are complicated. Our principles are in tension with each other. And so, uh, and they will be. And so the idea is for this to provide a framework for analysis and discussion, and then later for partnership and regulation. Mm -hmm. hmm. It sounds like, um, I mean, obviously education is a, is a massive part of this. Um, from what uh, Molly was saying there about libraries, librarians, all these, uh, you know, ways of outreach to people and educating us. It seems to me that um, a, a large part of the problem is that people don't realize that they have rights or that in some ways or the, the, what rights they sign in a way. We all, we all, I don't know, I do anyway, suffer from the thing of, you know, I try and use a piece of technology, mate, or whatever it might be, and it throws up a 50-page thing that says, you need to agree to this, and I'm, I'm out of time, you know, I'm like, I'm going to get on with this, I'm just going to say yes to that and get on with it. So is a part of the problem that, that people aren't aware of their rights and they're too willing to give them up. So I'm, I'm thinking probably that's a big part of this is to let make people realize that they, they don't necessarily have to give up those rights or that they could think about it a bit more. Uh, I'm going to direct that back at you again, Karen. Yeah, I'd love that you mentioned the EULA issue. I think um, the uh, there was a study done that showed that uh, if you did nothing but read the terms and conditions associated with uh, with all of the services that a, a, a normal an ordinary person signs up to, um, that it would you would have to do nothing but 
read those terms and conditions for three whole months. Um, and uh, people are desensitized to this. And so they're basically at the point where they just are clicking through and they say, oh, well, I know these terms are really terrible, but I have to use it. And worse still, when we're using these um, services and clicking through, we're often doing it from a position where we don't have power. So for example, if you're a parent who has to remote school your child and you're signing on to different services, you're going to confront those services at the moment you need to get your child onto remote learning. If you're in a meeting with somebody or if you're doing anything at all, usually you are installing that software or using it via the web at a point where you don't have any negotiation power. I should note that like you were all wonderful. And when we said, well, actually, we'd rather not use Skype and we'd rather use Big Blue Button because we'd like to use free and open source software and um, and ethical technology, you were able to say, sure, we'll investigate that. And so now we're using Big Blue Button and that's really fantastic. But that's a luxury that a lot of people don't have. And I think that if you don't even know about the problems of the technology that you're being asked to use and you know you can't possibly understand the terms, then there's simply no way to ask for anything different. So we have to put into a framework in terms of demanding this, this digital autonomy, this ethical approach. So I, I, I do have a question, but the first thing is I need to uh, uh, also thank um, Worldwide Technology for sponsoring uh, 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 Floss Weekly. So this episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Worldwide Technology, which is known simply as WWT. It's one of the top solution providers in the world delivering business and technology outcomes to large private and public organizations across the globe. WWT is in the business of digital transformation and one of the ways they support digital organizations with their digital transformations is by helping them adopt a multi-cloud architecture. They stay with organizations every step of the way from cloud vision and strategy to cloud enablement and migration to cloud optimization and management and everything in between. Their cloud consultants sit down with customers, formulate a vision and strategy. And because WWT knows that cloud investments only pay off uh, when they're aligned to business goals, everything comes out best. Through briefings and workshops, WWT helps some of the world's largest organizations unravel the complexities of cloud to unlock business opportunities. Experts in cloud migration and application development, WWT can create a secure landing zone in any cloud with on-demand labs that give organizations access to tools for microservices and cloud native development. And once in the cloud, WWT helps with cloud management and optimization because they know cloud is a continuum that requires constant attention to detail. Whether a strategy calls for cloud native, hybrid cloud, or on-prem resources, WWT works closely with Intel to optimize for the latest cloud smart solutions based on Intel technology for security, performance, and agility. They also feature Intel Optane persistent memory and other Intel technologies workload optimized to deliver affordable, large capacity and data persistence for solutions supporting everything from VDI to data analytics. To learn more and discover why organizations across industries turn to WWT to guide them on their cloud journeys, visit WWT.com slash twit. And don't forget to create a MyWWT account to access resources available through WWT's advanced technology center ecosystem. That's WWT.com slash twit. WWT delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. Okay, so so a, a question I have, and it, uh, I, I'll throw it to you, um, Molly, is I, I, I love that you're going after technology with this. I mean, uh, all of us on this call, I, I think, are also involved with academic institutions. And, and generally, in the academy, they're they're looking toward regulation. They're looking toward policy. They're looking, which in a way is kind of a top-down thing. Um, but you're look. You're talking to technologists. You're you want to evangelize this with technologists. How, how do you make that happen when ninety x percent of the technologists in the world that are employed are working? You know, they're not out to do, you know, personal autonomy. They're just helping some enterprise do what it does already. And how do you make this happen? Who are you after? 
Um, so I found that most people really do care about what they're doing. They Well, they want to care about what they're doing and they want to do something that they think is good or helps people. Um, finding technologists to talk to is pretty easy. Um, I think we've, I think I, I speak, I, I definitely speak for myself. I think I also speak for Karen and the rest of you as well. And I say like, you know, we've been living in communities of technologists for a long time, right? Like, um, my day job is still in a, like a technical project that builds technology um, at the GNOME Foundation, uh, which is like super cool. Um, but one of the things that that does is it's it's created this space where we have access to people who are the ones doing the building and the designing. Um, and it's also made it like really comfortable, right? Like I'm I'm much more comfortable talking to a room full of people who uh, build software than I am talking to a room full of academics, um, uh, by and large. Um, I, so I think people want to do good. I think people are ready to be, I think we're at a point in time where people are ready to take those steps to, to doing better. Um, I think they're ready to take the steps to, see what they're working on be reflected in something, reflect something that they think is important and valuable. Um, I know this isn't universal, but uh, you're seeing it more. You're seeing, uh, you know, I think, I think like the unionization of Kickstarter employees, uh, Google employees taking action and active roles, um, people at companies, like basically go like computer and companies basically going on strike. Um, you know, you're seeing that there are value that these people see that there is value in the world and that they want that to be reflected in the work they do. No tech for ice uh, is another really good example of that kind of collective organizing. Um, so I think that, you know, the, in a sense, like the time is ripe um, for helping to, to guide people and provide um, like possibilities to them. So, um, at least since I've um, started on the show, which is only a few months ago, but we've had like 15 or so uh, shows so far. A, a topic that we've covered pretty often is how far um, things have drifted. Basically, since Linux won, in many ways, open source and free software won a lot, and um, and 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 so much of the activity is happening much farther up the stack, uh, and. And a lot of people are, you know, they're using proprietary technology to write open source code and free software. Um, and this is the first time I'm, I'm hearing from you, Molly, that, that where there's not, I'm not hearing despair. I, I, I've heard a lot of despair about, um, geez, you know, the the kids today don't really care as much about free free and, and open source. But I, I'm wondering if you're sensing a groundswell here, that there is that maybe they've had enough, maybe enough techies have had enough, um, enough of the surveillance, enough of the locked up stuff, enough of the silos. Um, I'm really hoping there's some, I'm really hoping that they have, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit of hope out of what you're saying. Oh, that's, that's good. Cause I'm, I'm extremely hopeful. Um, I, the, the thing that I find really beautiful um, about digital autonomy is that it's looking beyond the technical infrastructure. It's looking beyond the code base. Um, and it's looking at like how technology fits into our lives, into our societies, into our cultures and into our existences and into ourselves. Um, and so, so when we talk about it, we're not just talking about like, is this software like, a piece of software, for example, being ethical is, is not just, you know, is it free and open? Like that is a step in the process because it is necessary for something to be like auditable, to be studyable, to, to be something that we can understand and process and, and like consent to and decide if it's a thing we really want to be using and interacting with. Um, uh, so, so, so I, I, you know, like to target very specifically one thing you said is, is like I see on, on like the social media conversations, like in, in one sense, a rejection of open source culture. Um, 
while not rejecting the ethical, while simultaneously embracing the ethical standards um, or, or ethical promise and hope that we had when we were in first introducing and growing free and open source software. Um, and I think it's just become like those seeds have just become so much more now and that people like there's one group of people who like want that, but want to see like what else can happen. There are people who uh, like kind of want to ignore that, like ignore these, this like, okay, so how does openness fit into this? And just say like, okay, like completely aside from that, how do we be ethical? How do we make sure use is ethical? How do we make sure development process is ethical? Um, like it, it, they, 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 like there are people who care about the, the, the people who are mining the 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 re, like the ores that turn into our cell phones there are people who care about the workers uh in stores selling these products um but they they just like they care about everyone along the use process and everyone is interacting with it and that's amazing and it's beautiful and it's inspiring so like of course there's hope because there are people who are like this and there are people who are loud about it mm. i think i think that's really great i mean it's good to hear, uh, as Doc said, it's great to hear people being loud about. I think it's really easy to kind of fall into this cynical mindset that a lot of uh, a, a lot of what we see in in culture today. You know, people like I don't really care anymore. But I don't think that's true from people I've spoken to. I mean, you, you've only got to look at the rise of things like. Um, you know, um, uh, environmental uh, things that people are really concerned about, like the veganism coming, rising up, way up now because people are worried about how we're, we're supplying things like meat and, and, and other things and, and all of those sorts of things. So I hope that there is some um, some kind of room for this. And I, I, th I think there is, I mean, I, I, I'm going to sound like a real old man now, but I mean, the kind of young people, uh, I'm going to call them young people, you know, like like whatever, mm -hmm. that I that I talk to, I think they do still care about these things. And um, maybe that's because I'm in a certain group of, you know, very techy kind of people who are into Linux or free software or whatever it might be. But I, I do think it spreads out wider as well. Um, so all this is leading to a question. If people are listening and thinking, "What the hell's good? What the hell's going on here?" It's not going to lead to a question, but um, it is. So I want to I want to ask Karen something, and I'm going to preface this by saying I I realise Karen that your your um, answer doesn't constitute legal advice. I thought I'd set up for you before you have to <laughs> jump in with that. If, <laughs> that's Karen's <laughs> usual disclaimer: is this this answer does not constitute legal advice. Um, Wait, can I answer it yeah. before you ask it? It de it depends. <laughs> Oh, of course. Yeah, that's the, the that's the yeah that's the legal answer to everything is maybe is what I've been told. Um, maybe it depends. That's good. Uh, yeah. So I was, I was when we were talking about how do we make this effective and how do we get people to buy in and stuff. We were talking about that earlier. I was wondering if there was some way people could sign up to this or, or you know we could get companies like a charter or something in in some ways. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Is that something that you've maybe thought about for down the line somewhere where people could say stick a badge on and say we you know subscribe to to, to the uh, to digital autonomy, uh, to the declaration of digital autonomy. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think it will come from, there are many different ways that this could be worked in um, to uh, frameworks like that. Like I think that we have that, that corporate perspective, but I, I, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll be more towards a, the consumer and the technologist approach. So technologists will, could approach this as sort of an, like an, an ethical rubric, like a professional society kind of declaration of ethics. Like um, uh, I was a member of, uh, I'm a member of the order of the engineer, which was a Canadian based uh, society where mm -hmm. um uh, engineers wear a ring on their the uh, the ring finger of their working hand to remind them. And I'm actually not wearing mine now, so that's I was about to hold up my hand, but I'm not wearing. <laughs> but uh, but it's to remind yourself of engineering failures. And the, the first rings were theoretically made from a bridge that had failed. And the idea that you're with your special knowledge and work comes a power, and that lives are in your hand. And so the idea is to is to f find a way to articulate these issues that affect technology um, in this just in this overarching way that technologists um, can um, can subscribe to. And then on the other hand, um, that consumers and consumer based organizations and um, and and uh, members of the public can ask the right questions about how their technology will affect them and make educated decisions, not just about what they will buy for themselves, but what also we'll invest in for our infrastructure. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that sounds really excellent. I was thinking of something, I, the only example that comes into my mind for some reason is something like the Rainforest Alliance. You see that on you know, that badge on a certain product. And I, I certainly I myself and a lot of people I know will look at that and go, oh, well, that sell that helps to sell that product to me because I know that they're subscribed into the, the Rainforest Alliance, wherever it might be, or they're trying to ethically make the product. Um, one thing I was kind of interested in, uh, I was thinking about this today when I was reading the, the declaration, um, and looking at kind of the situation in in the world today with with um, COVID nineteen and all the rest of it, do you, do you think that is kind of accelerating the um, the reliance on technology? We all use technology a lot. It's it's in everything now. I mean, cars and and public transport everywhere we go, we're interacting. You go in a shop, you have to deal with a computerized terminal often to to buy things. But it seems to me like now because the main way that we're we, many of us are being forced to communicate right now because of the, the health situation is through things technology like we're using right now um i'm gonna i, I was gonna direct this to, to molly actually do you think that's accelerating the need for something like the, the this uh the declaration uh yes i think i think it is it is definitely the time that the deck like this is the, totally the right time for the declaration to come out um, I'm kind of giggling as you say that because a little bit later today, uh, I have a Zoom meeting with my therapist because um, I do teletherapy uh, now since I cannot see my therapist in person. Um, and earlier today, I was talking to a very wonderful person about their very wonderful child um, who was in school uh, over the internet. Um, so, like, yeah, totally. Um, I. Uh, I was also doing, I, I, I wrote an article um, with uh, Dr. Kit Heinzman, who's a pedagogue and historian of science, um, about the way Zoom was interacting with classrooms um, and what that means from the perspective of student rights and like the, the power dynamics and the hierarchies. Um, so yeah, I think we're realizing, I, I kind of think there's two parts to it. And one of, one is that like, technology is super, super pervasive. And because we're communicating through it so explicitly now, we're seeing that communication, but also starting to see more of the other places that things tie in. Um, so like lots of people have home assistants now, uh, and I think are only really starting to think about them as like, oh, this is a computer in my home and I never considered that before. Yeah, so so I have a, a, a question about um, your organization. Okay, so when I look at the declaration, it's you two. Um, is this the entire organization as it now stands? Or, or do you have ambitions about this? Or would you like to join up with others? You know, I mean, I forget who said it, but it's always, you know, the, the command is always to find the others, even if you don't know who they are. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts about, about that? And I might add, by the way, that I, I have a friend who says for every new dot... Every new uh, nonprofit and other nonprofits should be killed off. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether you're 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 going five hundred one c three on this or what what your plans are. I'll direct that to uh, I, I guess I guess I'll put this this one to Molly, or <laughs> but it could be to either one of you. Sorry, uh, I should pick I, one. I, I think it's a mutual answer, uh, and and part of this is. Um, uh, Karen's organization, where Karen works, the Software Freedom Conservancy, one of the things they yeah. do is they provide fiscal sponsorship. Um, I used to be on the board of the Open Source Initiative, which also provides fiscal sponsorship. Uh, in some cases, GNOME provides something that looks a lot like fiscal sponsorship. Um, I think I speak for both of us when I say the world does not need more nonprofits. Uh, it instead needs more projects to join wonderful organizations like the Conservancy. Um, uh, underneath their umbrellas of fiscal sponsorship. So that's one thing. Um, uh, it, it's, it's us. Uh, we sometimes meet socially distanced uh, outside. Sometimes we meet online. Um, this, is, this is purely a labor of love, an act in our free time. Um, as this whole thing was going on, I thought, oh, maybe I should make a pitch and say if we get $6,500 of donations, we can hire an outreachy intern to work for us. Um, then we would need a more formal project. <laughs> I'm going to hand this off to Karen now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that like a lot of the thoughts that we have 
that are expressed in the declaration come from a lot of great conversations with so many people who are our leaders and amazing people in um, in, in generally the free and open source software space. And uh, that includes the two of you as well, and probably some of the listeners here as well. And so this is, uh, is putting down our latest thinking and we deliberately published it as a, an early draft version so that we could invite people to participate. So we have an email address, uh, which is thoughts at techautonomy.org, where you can tell us what you think. And we're going to use that to figure out what our next, next steps are and um, how formally or informally we should continue uh, the work that we're doing. I think that uh, Molly's right. I don't, I don't think we foresee forming a new organization around this, but we do foresee how having important partnerships with all of the organizations that are doing important work that constitutes a, a, a very important foundational part of this effort towards digital autonomy. So if we can unite all of the organizations that are already working on these issues, even if they aren't articulating them as we are, then we can really have something that will make a, make a big impact. Yeah, so I, I I was just saying to Doc there in our little, uh, you actually answered the question there, Karen, that I didn't even ask. That's how, that's how intuitive you you are that you worked <laughs> that out. But I was just I was just saying to Doc, um, it, it it seemed to me when you're talking about the organisational side of this, that um, something like EFF, the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, there, there are groups out there that um, whose goal or whatever or mission, whatever you want to call it, I think would would sit quite well with what what you're trying to achieve as well. So. You, you've kind of answered this, but presumably you'd like to kind of tie in with some of the things that they do, access their kind of, you, you know, their, their great communities and, and the traction that they've already got. Yeah, and not just the EFF, there's all, all the other organizations in our field too. Um, and each of the organizations has a particular focus, right? All of which fit under the umbrella of digital autonomy. But you know, it, and if one organization has a uh, a privacy bend, another one might have a you know uh, an access to data or patients' rights, or um, you know, or 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 because the field is so big, and each of our organizations were were founded on a niche, and all of us have been expanding, right? Like even Conservancy has uh, has has you know we we do we Molly mentioned outreachy, which is work on diversity, all within the framework of software freedom. And so we're all sort of expanding because we realize that these issues are big and they're so interrelated. But I, I feel strongly that we need a framework to weave that together and to unite all of our different organizations so that we can work towards the same goal. Mm. And I'm interested, uh, uh, something just flashed into my mind there when you said it's uh, it's like an umbrella, that they all definitely fit under this umbrella. And uh, maybe you could you could kind of and he said, "Brand yourselves." That's that feels like a horrible term to use in this case, but maybe you could kind of brand yourselves as a um, an ethical upstream for these these kind of things. You know, for something for the developers to get into. They they like uh, you could say we're upstream and we're we're kind of you know hoping that all these people will contribute back into the project. Anyway, like so um, yeah, that's we'll we'll workshop some slogans or something <laughs> with the marketing <laughs> team and get right onto that. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I've hijacked I've hijacked what Doc was going to ask. Anyway, so uh, to, uh, far away, Doc. I'll throw it back to you. I, I, actually, it, it occurs to me listening to um, your, your answer there, Karen. Um, I, I, digital autonomy is actually more overarching. I mean, that sounds to me like that's the umbrella, um, because it, it's it's sort of in, in all these different organizations um, and have have an have an interest in this. It's almost like this is a this is a this is a voice that's not often heard, you know, and and or an angle at least on a on a voice that's not often heard. So and and I, that's not like that's more like an observation than a question, I suppose. Is this a time where I can make a Karen joke about how Karen's oh, please. Karen's make sure their voices are obnoxiously heard? I'd like to talk to the manager <laughs> about our digital autonomy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I, I was waiting for you to say everything is a free software issue. I was waiting for you and Molly to get into the how every issue is really a free software issue. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to, if you want to toss us one, we could bring out that old show and and do the everything is a free <laughs> software issue show again. I, nobody ever wanted it after the first time, but it's a great show. So, so we're we're actually uh, coming. We're, we've we've been given a little bit of extra time um, because we started late, which is good. <laughs> But we're getting down to where um, we, we we generally have a final four questions that uh, 
that we go through, and that may take us to 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 the last to the last few minutes. Um, one is, and and this is this is a, this is our control question because we always have it, uh, and there doesn't have to be an answer. Is like, do you have anything to say about blockchain? <laughs> and and either one of you can. It looks like Molly's guffawing more <laughs> than than Karen. So <laughs> uh, I think is it is it Benno who has a great talk on blockchain? Who does the lightning talk? Oh, you're thinking of Rusty Russell, I think, right? The the, the and then they call it the blockchain. It's, it's a lightning. Talk. It's on at Siegel and at LCA, so yeah. So th- but that's more well, common on blockchain. That, that that may go. That may take us as far as uh, and, and as far as we can go. Um. Uh, <laughs> so so another is um, and I should have asked this first. Is are, are there any questions we haven't asked? Like I, when we talked yesterday, or you know, you, you said what what's the toughest question we could ask? So I could ask you that. What was the, what's the toughest question we haven't asked? And I'll address that to Molly. <laughs> Just because I have to pick one. I, I, think, I think the toughest question you could ask right now would be, um, uh, why should free software communities care about diversity? Uh, <laughs> because it has nothing to do with the actual conversation <laughs> and therefore would be a very tough one to answer. Well, except that it's it's um, it, it that's one of those overarching things that's just giant in the world right now. So, um, yeah. and and I should point out by the way that at Linux Journal, um, which started out by the way as the Free Software Journal in 1994, and then Linux showed up and became Linux Journal, our readership was 99 plus percent male, um, and our, our subscribers base was, and that was and we and we were 100 percent owned by women which is another, and, and run by women at that time, uh, which is an interesting thing. And I, I'm not sure that would happen now, but the ratio is, that ratio is bad. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that's just one ratio, right? Um, so, but, uh, but I, I mean, I, I think diversity is, a, you know, it's, it's, it, it's front burner, at least, uh, you know, for a lot of us. I'm glad you guys are working on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, a question you can for You direct that for question both. to Karen, too, because I'd like to hear what okay, she says. Okay, Karen, it, 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 to touch on that one, because we've only really got about a minute left, So, and, and I have one more question for both of you. Yeah. I, no, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with everything that you said. When we originally started thinking about, uh, when we first, uh, the GNOME community started Outreachy, when it was Outreach Program for Women, there were 181 applicants to uh, the Google Summer of Code um, projects there that they posted and none of them were women. And so we, we definitely have a real problem, but the problem is not just with gender diversity, it's with all kinds of diversity. So Outreachy is now not a, the outreach program for women. It is focused on systemic bias instead and the impact of discrimination, which seems like the way we should go. And so I, I'm going to be really annoying and just say like earlier we in the show, there was a reference to what grandparents may or may not understand. It's another like we, we need to think about like, you know, Actually, there are a lot of grandparents, some of whom are, are you know, are very amazing, you know, like are amazing developers and are very tech savvy. Mm. But there is a problem that folks that don't have access to technology would understand um, these issues that are related to them that we cover in the Declaration for Digital Autonomy. And I think when we think inclusively, we can fix these problems, not just for one area of underrepresentation, but for all of them. If we just sort of think, how do we approach everyone? How do we make everybody feel comfortable and welcome? Okay, so uh, the the last question, and I'll, you guys should take it one at a time, and we'll start with uh, Molly, and then go to go to Karen. What is your favorite um, uh, scripting language and text editor? So I don't write things that aren't copy and pa- copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. Um, but I think the Python people throw a good party. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and the high people also throw a good party. Um, mm. And I use get it for everything. Mm-hmm. Ooh, and you call it get it. I've never heard anybody call it get it. Uh, I'm a <laughs> traditional VI user, 
but uh, uh, but I have been using Gedit. Well, I thought that's how you pronounced it, but I kind of like Gedit a lot better. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've been using <laughs> I've been using it more. But I, I recently have gone back to using Vi again. I know that's kind of sacrilege to a lot of people. Well, that's well, that's great, and we've we've managed to squeeze out uh, an extra ten minutes. It almost makes up for the fifteen that we lost at the front end. And uh, apologies for that, those of you who are watching live, and not to those of you who are listening later. Um, it has been great having having you on the show. Um, it's at techautonomy.org, and um, uh, p please participate in that. and And thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. So. So Dan, um, what do you know now that you didn't know before? <laughs> how did, how did wow, you're, ask, you? you're asking me the tough questions. Well, I know that I, I, yeah. my initial uh, idea of what digital autonomy was 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 well, I, I have to say wrong because it is personal. But I, I misread what I what I misread the title for, so I realize it's nothing to do with necessarily to do with cars specifically. <laughs> um, so that's good. Um, now, I, what do I know? I, all kinds of things. I think it's great that. Um, the idea that we talked about that this could be because um, it really is a kind of a, an overarching um, an overarching thing. That, that's kind of what we were coming to there at the end, wasn't it? That uh, a lot of the the things like the free software movement and, and other things uh, that we've been involved with and, and, and we've really supported over the years, all these are different kind of ethical and technical movements do really fit into this kind of uh, umbrella of, of digital autonomy. I love that as a, as a term. I think that's really interesting. You know, there's, there's something I, I, I realized that I want to explore, and it's something that's a little bit on the intellectual side, but it it it, it matters, which is that um, diversity is is a human condition. We all look different, and we all sound different, so we can tell each other apart. Um, mm -hmm. That's part of what makes us human, and we are infinitely diverse. Two identical twins, um, we they come from the same genome. One may become trans we have a number of cases like that and we ever we're all very we are all, we are autonomous by nature and tech has not sufficiently represented that has not sufficiently addressed that because generally with tech you want to cover a lot of people you know you want to cover a lot of users and we see us just as users and not just as not as people who do more than just use um i actually see a, a big backlash coming against the term user as well user is going to turn into a bad word after a while. And that's another thing uh, to touch on. So um, now I've learned a lot of, um, about where this is going. And I and after the show, I want to follow up um, uh, with Molly and Karen on this because I think there's so many ways we, we can collaborate. So tell us what you want to plug and then I'll get to what I want to plug along those lines. <laughs> Now we get to the gratuitous plugs. Um, yeah, they get the gratuitous there plugs. Isn't a hell of, Why not? There isn't a massive amount to plug, really. People can, uh, people who are watching on the, the video stream or watching the recorded video will be able to see uh, my website down there in the, in the lower third, danlynch.org. Uh, that's my blog, and there's various things on there, uh, podcasts, uh, music, uh, blogs, funnily enough, blog posts <laughs> on the blog. Uh, and you can, I'm probably most active on Twitter, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at MethodDan, uh, which is also in the lower third there. And, and that's about it for now, I think. Well, thanks. I, and in in my case, um, I'd invite people to look at uh, um, an overlapping document. I think that uh, we've been working on a project VRM and with Customer Commons uh, called Privacy Manifesto. And I think privacy. We didn't. I don't think the word privacy was even used in this uh, uh, in this show. But it's a big part of it as well. I mean, if you're autonomous, you have the the power to assert your privacy right you know and, it, and the uh, privacy is definitely in the in the sorry i'm interrupting you there doc but privacy is definitely yeah. a big part of the the statement if people people want to read uh, which they should do if people want to read the declaration and maybe submit their thoughts and yeah. get involved uh, at techautonomy.org it, it privacy is a whole section of it yeah yeah so um <laughs> i'm looking at the back channel here i don't I'll not pay attention to that. so so our, our guest um, next week is Mark uh, Frischmuth of the Democracy Lab talking tech for good. So I want to get in a little plug for that. So uh, come back with us next week. And we are moving uh, into the end of our time here. So thanks so much, everybody. Um, this has been Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles, and we'll see you next week. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. Got a question for you. 
Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more. <music>